examination of different texts, of opinions, of political perspectives, of society, being able to critically think. Taking philosophy at RCM gave me the inclination to question everything. I think it's been a humbling thing, a little bit unsettling as well because everything is uncertain, but it has made life very interesting to take nothing for granted. If philosophy is the art of uh, thinking, uh, it's, uh, yeah, that's a very general description. I guess it's not similar to math, really, uh, as in math, a lot of things are sort of right or wrong. And in philosophy, I think it helps you navigate uh, the many gray areas that you will encounter in, in life. For me, philosophy is a very active thing, rather than just the passive study of old texts that people wrote who have already died. <laughs> it's very active and it also brings me together with people in discussions, in conversations, not only in the classroom, but also in long sessions on cantina tables at dinner where we would talk about the existence of the soul or whether we actually have free will. And all of these experiences made me actually grow closer to people and make connections more meaningful and it also made me challenge my own ideas, my own beliefs. It enabled me to test out my own theories with other people. As John Stuart Mill would say, they became living truths rather than dead dogma. Philosophy um, is about asking the questions behind the questions that everybody asks, so it's kind of like zooming out and looking from things from above, and that applies to everything, like the, situ the situation we're in at the moment. Um, well, like climate justice things are related really to, and yeah, so that's very much still with me. And like taking philosophy at RCN, and like now in college also, um, just teaches me to think critically and question what I read, question what I do. I would describe philosophy as an old, it's still an orthodox subject where we discuss ideas and we discuss the reality we live in. I think philosophy is uh, just an ambitious way of thinking about things. So I, I think philosophy in, at its core is that you think about questions, difficult questions, but you do it ambitiously and with quite a high demand on your own answers. So it's a way of, of approaching questions. Um, I think philosophy is essentially offering a bunch of big answers to big questions. Um, and it's also kind of like having a brain simulator in your brain. <laughs> it's kind of like having a simulator in your brain and you sort of like, sort of you picture all these like possible consequences of your action and then you choose the best one to carry out in life. Most generally it's the study of fundamental questions about the nature of reality and about our relationship with reality. You're cutting the cheese the wrong way. I'm not free to do this, Lucky. I'm determined to do it. Oh. Philosophers. So cool! Look at the beautiful city! Hey! What? What? Why did you do that? What did I do? You just pushed me! Well, I can! Well, you can't! Of course I can! Why can I do that? Because I am a person! Human and I have human rights! Obviously, you're not a person! What? You don't even have human DNA! What do you mean? Am I person? A human? Am I not human being? Where's my self? I don't know where it is. Oh my god. Self! Self, where are you? Self, where is it? Lucky, lucky, I can't find myself. Where's my self? I can't find it anywhere. Did you check the trash bin? Oh, self? Self? Is it there? No, it's there. I don't know where it is. I don't know where my self is. So, try and find myself. Where? I don't know. Where's the self? Self! 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 A big philosophical debate has been whether we can separate 
the mind and body from one another. Vicky. Yes. Today, I'm going to use an example that we can separate the mind and body from each other. Are you ready for me to cut you? Yes, I'm so ready. No. Please be careful. I'm not All going right. to die. Three, two, one. Ooh. I'm going to pull you one more time. Ooh. Thank you. Oh my god, look at that. Mind and body separated. Diggy, good. now I need you to wiggle your, your legs. Look at that. Amazing. Now, wave at me. Amazing. Now I need you to wiggle your, your hands, your legs, and wave at me at the same time. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. We have solved the mind and body problem. There are so many brilliant, funny, and uh, interesting people. Philosophy has made me more interested, it's made me more critical, and it, it was also just a really fun experience where I learned a lot and I have a lot of very good memories. I also like that it challenges my thinking. It's difficult to define how philosophy impacts me. I never really know when I'm doing philosophy or how I'm doing it. It's so inherent in the way that I think. Um, I guess though that it does impact me a lot in my studies. I do international relations. And philosophy still impacts my life in the ways that I think. Now I don't make a conversation just to reply, but I actually, you know, the skills in my class teach me to listen to people properly before answering. You get to see another side of your peers as well. Critically thinking about what you want to follow purposefully. Philosophy has become a really central part of my life ever since then. I did philosophy at university, I uh, got a PhD in philosophy, and now I have the amazing luck of being able to do philosophy for a living. So I'm a member of faculty at the Department of Philosophy at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, I research and I teach in uh, social and political philosophy and feminist philosophy. And these were really the areas I fell in love with while at RCN. I wrote my extended essay in political philosophy. Um, so now I get to pursue these questions that puzzled me then and still puzzle me now. And I get to share the texts and ideas that I love so much with my students as well. What I like about philosophy class is the interesting discussions that we have, um, where the student's opinion is also included. You get like, <laughs> you discover like this ocean. Seeing a lot of people in cantina or a lot of discussions in a different way, which is dumb and stupid. You can question, but further than question, like to create what you actually believe. It helped me make a lot of sense of things going on in my life when I was at RCN and it continues to do so even now, especially given the situation that we all find ourselves right now. And whenever I feel lost in this place, I will kind of, you know, do the classical philosophical contemplation. I would as you know, you know, who I am, what's my place in the community. Philosophy is a deeply fulfilling uh, discipline if you choose to take it. by some students at the United World College Red Cross Nordic in Norway to share some thoughts on what it takes to do philosophy well. Well, there are things that you'll always be told and there's some truth to them. So certainly read the greats. We have thousands of years of literature in philosophy. Some of the greatest minds in history have thought about these problems before. So whatever you do, don't ignore them. Don't try and think in a vacuum. And there's also some stuff about the skills you need. In particular, in the kind of university I went to, there's a great emphasis placed on logic. So whether or not you actually go on and do formal logic, it's useful to learn a bit because it teaches you about the, the rigor of argument, about 
really knowing whether or not something follows in an argument from something else. And of course, you can also get broader critical thinking skills around learning to spot fallacies and so forth. Now, I think all these things are useful and I really don't want to downplay them, but I do think this advice really misses something important out, which is that if you've got all these skills, well, you can be very clever, you can certainly pass philosophy exams and you can understand a great deal. But to be quite frank with you, there are lots of people who have excellent skills in this area, but they're not good philosophers. Why is that? What's missing? Well, I think what's missing is difficult to put your finger on. And philosophers don't like this. We like to be able to define things very clearly. Starting with clear definitions is another piece of advice that's often given if you want to, to do philosophy well. But I think it really centres around the idea of attention. And I think attention is a neglected idea in, in Western philosophy. In other words, if you're really trying to understand something, you have to attend very carefully to whatever it is that you're looking at. Now, it might sound obvious, but actually so often that doesn't happen in philosophy. If you take something like free will, why is free will an interesting issue? It's an interesting issue because it relates to something we assume important about what it is to be a person. But a lot of the philosophy of free will is not actually attending to the phenomena of being an individual with or without liberty is attending to arguments about free will which other philosophers have given. So you get caught up in these kind of scholastic disputes and you actually lose sight of what it is you're trying to understand. So I think this ability to focus your attention on the phenomenon you're trying to explain and to understand is absolutely essential. When you do that, another skill is this ability to you know, put your finger on something, get to the heart of the matter. So often I think philosophers don't do that. They, they find things where there are flaws in arguments, they find inconsistencies, they find definitional problems, but they don't actually put their finger on exactly what matters about this. Now, it's hard to do that. There's no algorithm for doing that. No set of philosophical tools can tell you how to do it, but it's what you've got to be trying to do if you want to do philosophy well. What I'm talking about here are really what we might call epistemic virtues. That's the terminology at the moment. It's about the kind of virtues that you need to do philosophy well, rather than the skills. And I think there's an ethical dimension to this. And one ethical dimension is, is humility. You've actually got to be somewhat humble to do philosophy well. Remember, it's not about showing how clever you are. It's not about whether you have come up with a great argument or not. And it's certainly not about whether or not you can come up with some great theory. Unfortunately, I get emailed all the time by people who think they've cracked the great problems of philosophy and they're intelligent people, but they're working in a vacuum and they're determined to make their own breakthrough rather than try to understand it. So it's not about you. Try and understand things as best you can. And most of the time, I suggest probably all of the time, that will mean basically bringing together ideas of others. I mean, that's all that I do. I wrote a book on free will, which I'm very happy with, but I don't think it contains a single original idea. I think what I've tried to do is put it together in a way which makes sense and applies it. But I don't think I could have written that book if I had been looking to develop my own new novel, Exciting Theory. And another thing to do with humility is not just to be a philosopher. I think there's so much that we can learn from things like psychology, science, economics, politics, sociology, anthropology, history, literature, the list is almost endless. So don't just be a philosopher, cast your net widely. You can sum this up if you like by saying that you should be open, but not open in that kind of anything goes way. The rigour of philosophy is very important. Think clearly and be demanding, but be open. I think if you start with the right attitude to philosophy, then much of the rest that matters about it follows quite naturally. Hello. I shall try to answer the questions that Tabia has sent me. The first question is, what is philosophy? Rather a difficult question to give a sensible answer to, but most generally it's the study of fundamental questions about the nature of reality and about our relationship with reality. The next question is, why should one pursue the study of philosophy? Well, lots of people, perhaps most people, ask themselves philosophical questions. 
for instance, about the nature of persons, about consciousness and how it relates to the physical world, about free will and responsibility, about good and bad, right and wrong, about the existence or non-existence of God or gods, and so on. The study of philosophy is just the disciplined study of questions of this sort. Of course, it's not to everyone's taste, but as well as being difficult and challenging, it can also be enormously enjoyable and rewarding. The next question is, what made me interested in philosophy? I think probably my encounter with Plato was part of my study of classics at school. The next question is, in my opinion, is philosophy a useful discipline? Yes. It's not so much that the answers to philosophical questions are useful, though they can be. What is quite generally useful is the way of thinking that it encourages. One learns to think about difficult questions carefully, rigorously, and above all, honestly. One learns not to accept answers just because they're easy or attractive or fashionable. One learns to question and to think for oneself. All those things are surely useful. The next question is, what is the role and value of philosophers in today's society? Well, not as Plato thought, to rule the world. But to scrutinise and, where necessary, to challenge views about society, about how governments and nations should behave, about how we should behave towards each other, and how we should behave towards nature in all its forms. The next question is, how did my studies of philosophy affect my, my views of the world? Well, it made me question things more. It made me take seriously opposing views. It made me less certain of things. Of course, Certainty is not always a bad thing, especially in practical life, but it can be terribly dangerous. Next question is, do I have an intellectual hero or other previous philosophers who inspired me? Well, certainly my heroes would include Plato, Aristotle, Descartes, David Hume and Kant. If I had to pick just one, it would be Hume. He was surely the greatest philosopher writing in English, and he's a model of clarity of thought and intellectual courage. But admiration is one thing, and agreement is another. Greatly as I admire Hume, I disagree with almost all his central views. And the final question is, how do I think that one should do philosophy? Well, of course, one should think for oneself. But to do that profitably, one needs to find out what other people have thought, and one needs to discuss one's views with other people and to listen to criticisms and comments. Dialogue is essential. And it goes without saying that one's aim should be not to win an argument, but to get at the truth. I'd like to add one more hero. He was a philosopher of the early sixth century called Boethius. Now, Boethius wrote a great philosophical work called The Consolation of Philosophy. It was enormously popular in the Middle Ages, not much known today, perhaps. Now, the thing about this was that he wrote this work while he was in prison, waiting sentence of death. 
that's quite something. We want to thank all the philosophers who kindly decided to join us in our project. Dr. Baghini, Professor Chalmers, Professor Grayling, Mr. Rice, Mr. Silvery. And we would like to extend our thanks to all the current and former students. Amber, Anita, Annika, Asta, Diki, Emma, Filippa, Haya, Helene, Isabel, Jonathan, Kim, Lucky, Niklas, Sadrak, Salome, Shaim and Tabia. The soundtrack is Liebestraum number 3 by Liszt, played by Agnes Schoblad.